Hey there, whatever you might be doing right now, I bet it's not as important as spending a few minutes in God's Word. You know, His Word is a lamp to our feet, it's a light to our path. The Bible says to desire the sincere milk of the Word that you can grow thereby. So let's grow a little bit, let's get a little illumination, get into the Word together. I like being outside. Uh, inside's okay, outside much better. Um, if I can, I'm outside without shoes on. If I can, I'm outside where there's trees and water or uh, something of the sort. I've spent most of my life um, camping, backpacking, just doing things like that. Spent a lot of time in a lot of wilderness areas, sometimes for protracted periods of time. And uh, there's always essential things you want to take with you. I remember as a, I was probably 16, and I talked a friend of mine into coming on a backpacking trip, just the two of us. And, and he'd been before, you know, and we'd, you know, take our packs, and we've got everything. We, we're carrying a tent. We've got all sorts of food. I said, listen, let's not do one of those. I said, on this one, we just take the bare essentials. We'll each take a knife, take a fishing pole, and our boots, and that's all. He says, Bayless, we can't do that. I said, we can. It's only three days, actually four days and three nights. We can do this. He goes, no, 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 no. We can't. I said, we can. And he, he just wouldn't do it. Finally, I said, all right, we'll you can take a sleeping bag, but you can't take a backpack. You just got to you know, put a belt around it, carry it over your shoulder. He says, what about food? I said, we'll, we'll catch fish. We'll forage. You, we don't need to take any food. He says, no, no, we have to take food. I said, all right, one potato each. <laughs> he said, how are we going to cook it? I said, all right, you can take a little piece of tin foil. We'll wrap it in the foil. We'll throw it in the coals of the fire. And, and that's it. So he finally agreed. And I was a little unhappy because we have to take a sleeping bag and a potato now. And the potatoes ended up being a bust because you know, we buried them in the coals of the fire, left them in too long, and they turned into hand grenades. We couldn't eat them. <laughs> But uh, having matches back there, a good pair of boots, a knife, that fishing pole, they were the essentials. We could have stayed back there a long time with those. But without any of those things, it would have been really, really rough going. And I want to talk to you tonight about navigating some of the hard seasons of life, and some of the essentials that you need. I've had to navigate myself times of betrayal, seasons of disappointment, um, seasons when I didn't understand what was going on, where I just sort of felt in the dark and what, what's going on and God, what are you doing and why are these things happening? Like everyone, you may be here tonight and you're, you're trying to navigate a season of bitter disappointment in your life. Maybe... You've been betrayed by someone you love. Maybe you've had a relationship breakup. Maybe there's stuff going on in your family right now. It may be a very hard season for you economically. You may be in a very difficult season physically. Maybe you've received news from the doctor. Maybe you're stressed out over your kids. And maybe any, any sort of thing, just this um, uncertainty about your own future. Well, let me talk to you about some essentials if you're going to make it through the season that you're going through right now. The first one, I want you to look with me in 1 John chapter 4. It's believing in God's love. That is foundational, essential, pivotal, cannot do without believing in God's love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, and we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Look in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. He is the initiator. Fear brings torment. I've experienced a bit of torment in my life 
especially in years past, tormented about a great many things, tormented about my future, tormented in regards to relationships. Even as a young Christian, tormented before I was saved, and then as a young Christian, tormented with the fear of the devil because I'd been involved in some uh, pretty bizarre occultic things. I found out that the devil was real. In fact, before I came to Christ, I was more convinced the devil and evil spirits were real than God because of some of the, the things that I had encountered. And consequently, I, I came to Christ, but I found myself haunted by the fear of the devil, literally tormented. But when I came to understand that God unconditionally loved me, all of that changed. It says we have known and believed the love that God had for, has for us. Perfect love cast out fear. I know a guy left the cabin of his boat open to air things out and some pigeons came to roost inside the cabin of the boat. Well, when he found out the pigeons were in there, he didn't say, well, you know, I guess they're just there. No, he went and chased them all out and got rid of their nest and everything else. And when you understand that God loves you, that love chases fear and torment out of your mind. It chases fear and torment out of your heart. Your whole life begins to change once you understand and believe that God loves you. You might be thinking, but you, you don't know how many times I've failed. You don't know how many times I've knowingly stepped into the same mess. He loves you. He loved you before you knew him, and he doesn't love you any less now. Even when you don't understand what's going on or why, you need to believe he loves you. I have come to bank everything on my belief that he is good and that he loves me. Even when I mess up, I know he loves me and he's for me and he will not abandon me. Now, he certainly corrects me. The Bible says he's a loving father and father corrects every son that he receives and God will correct us and deal with us about things just like a good earthly parent will correct their child because they want to save them from future consequences, and sin does have consequence. Thank God, I believe in the grace of God, but there is an extreme message of grace right now as if sin had no consequences. It does have consequence, and that's why God deals with us and chastens us so we can re repent and hopefully circumvent those consequences that come from sin. I'm going to correct my children if they're being lazy or if they're playing around with a light socket or doing, because there's future consequences that can be dire if I don't deal with them now. And so God loves me. He loves you. He will correct us. But it's an act of love because he doesn't want us to have to partake of the fruit or the consequences of sin. But listen to me. When bad or difficult circumstances arise... I never, ever even entertain the thought that God is punishing me over some past transgression. Yeah. I remember when we went through our difficulties with this property and they were elongated. It went over a long period of time and there were certain, who I'll say mean Christians, who said, oh, Jesus is against you because you're introducing some new worship in the church and he doesn't like it. Or Jesus is against you. He's fighting against you because you've done some things wrong. And people actually came up to me and told me that was the source of our troubles, that God was fighting against us because God was angry with us and God was displeased with us. That is not the heavenly father that I have come to know and love because he first loved me. And I just want to tell you tonight, you need to know and believe that he loves you. If you have torment in your life, you've not yet been perfected in love. God loves you, my friend. There's nothing you could do to make him stop loving you. And yes, he will correct you. But it's so that you can avoid the consequences of sin. I think about David. You know, he messed up with Bathsheba. All right, David, bad move. You know, you, you, she shouldn't have been out there on the rooftop taking a bath. Okay, we get that. But the moment you saw her, you should have gone inside rather than stare. 
and you shouldn't follow through and slept with her, and you sure shouldn't have had her husband killed when you found out that she was pregnant because he was one of your most loyal men. Horrific sin. But David never repented, at least not for a year. He covered it up, and God gave him every opportunity to repent, and the wheels of that just continued to turn and turn until finally Nathan the prophet came and told him the story. There was a man who had one little one little lamb, and he loved it, and it drank out of his cup, and was like his own kid, and, and, and then a rich neighbor had some visitors, and rather than taking one of the, the sheep out of his flock, he went and grabbed this man's only lamb, and he slaughtered it and served it to his guest, and David, being a shepherd, and understanding how attached you can be, David says, the man needs to die. They did that. Nathan said, it's you. You took away Urias wife and made her your own and you killed Uriah. David finally repents and, and Nathan says, God's forgiven the iniquity of your sin. And I believe that if David would have done that straight away, that he could have circumvented all the consequences that were to come. God said, you're forgiven, but there's going to be consequence. There's going to be fruit from it. And David reaps some very bitter fruit in his own family and in his own life. And that is why God does, and I know somebody needs to hear this tonight. I wasn't planning on saying all this at all. That's why God does deal with us. He, he's given us a gift to, to dig up, you know, the, the, the bitter seed of sin before it can produce fruit. And that gift is a shovel called repentance. But the Bible says sin, when it's not repented of, eventually issues forth in death in one form or another. And so God in his love deals with us and deals with us and deals with us to, to, to confess our sin before him and, and, and to get it out and to get washed in the precious blood. But friend, don't ever think that he doesn't love you. He does love you, and that is essential. Secondly, look with me at the book of Acts chapter 20. This is a second essential thing, especially if you're trying to navigate a hard season. You need to cling to God's word. Look at the context here. Paul has a group of leaders together, and he's about to depart from them. He's poured his heart and soul into them. And in verse 29, he says, For I know this, Acts 20 and 29, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Paul said, look, there's a bad season coming. God has showed me what's going to happen. This is gonna, there's going to be wolves. Some of you guys that are standing here, you're going to go south. You're going to go off the rails. You're going to take people with them. There's some rough times coming. But the antidote is I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that's able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. And friends, in the roughest of times, the word of God will not only salvage us, it will sustain us and bring us through as victors. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 105, that his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I can honestly tell you, in every season that I've gone through, God has always given me a word to lean upon. You see, something amazing happens when we spend time in his word. It will begin to speak to us. And listen, I, I love the electronic age we're in. It's great. But I wonder if, you know, it's just that I've got the Bible on my phone or on whatever electronic device I have. I wonder if those that are more techie spend that time in the word. It's one of the great things about, you know, Having a leather-bound Bible, I like to write in it, I like to read it. You know, it's a good thing to read on your knees and to spend time in it. And God will speak to you from his word. If you're in a crisis right now, if you're trying to navigate a hard time, God wants to talk to you. But the main way he will speak to you and anchor you is through his book. Look with me, if you would, at Proverbs 6 just for a moment. Proverbs 6 and 
verse 20. Here Solomon is talking about the word of God that came to him through his parents and admonishing others to listen to that word. In verse 20, Proverbs 6, My son, keep your father's command. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. Now, he's talking about the word of God that his father and his mother taught him. And he's saying, look, make it a priority in your life. Spend time with it. And, you know, the language he uses basically means spend time in the word. When you do, something is going to happen. That word is going to begin talking to you. It'll begin speaking to you. Spend time in the book. Here's a third one. This is an essential. Going through a rough patch, you need friends. You need friends. Friendship is essential. Look with me in Judges chapter 18. I only have five of these in all, so when I'm done with this one, I'll be two-thirds of the way through. <laughs> Judges, the 18th chapter. Just a, a story that illustrates the importance of relationships. Verse 7, Judges 18. So the five men departed and went to Laish. They saw the people who were there, how they dwelt safely in the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians, and they had no ties with anyone. Accentuate that. They had no ties with anyone. Let's read a little further in the same chapter, verse 27. It says, so they took the things Micah had made and the priest who had belonged to him and went to Laish to a people quiet and secure. And they struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. There was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon and they had no ties with anyone. I have been strengthened and helped immensely by friends through the years, especially during some of the wilderness seasons that I have gone through. Make friends when you don't need them, and you will find they will be there when you do need them. Just for a moment, just touch the general vicinity where your belly button is. Come on. Don't touch somebody else's, just touch yours. <laughs> All right, that, that's a lifelong reminder that you came into this world, you started life connected to someone else. God has wired it into us to be connected to other people. We need friends. How many people here that are dated, and I know they've got these retro television shows on, so you may be young and have watched. Anybody here watch Gilligan's Island? Come on. Go Gilligan. Man, that was a big thing in the neighborhood. I mean, we were out all day long from morning till night, our folks never saw us, ever, <laughs> except we came in when Gilligan's Island was on. Old black and white watching Gilligan's Island. I remember a show. Everybody got mad at Gilligan, as they did many times. And so Gilligan is sort of heartbroken, and they've all spoken harsh words to him, and he goes to the other side of the island and starts living in a cave by himself. And everybody's sitting around the table there, and they all start talking about their little buddy. Skipper gets this sad look on his face, and he, I think he was the first one to get up, and he goes across the island and comes in the cave to be with Gilligan. And then might have been Mary Ann. She gets up, and she's sad, and she goes across the island, goes in the cave to find Gilligan. And then the professor, and then Ginger went, and then Thurston Howell III and his wife. And everybody finally goes. They're all in the cave, and then a typhoon came. And it destroyed their whole encampment, and everyone's life was saved because they were in the shelter of the cave. There's really quite a lesson there. Friend, friendships can save your life. A true friend can save your life, especially when you're going through a rough patch. In fact, if nothing else, sometimes they'll say, look, just chill out. It's not as bad as you think it is. The Bible says that... Uh, Real friend loves 
at all times. And you might say, but I don't have any friends. The best way to have friends is to be a friend. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 24, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. And then when you have a friend, be loyal to that friend. The scripture says in Proverbs 27, your own friend and your father's friend do not forsake. To me, probably the most important thing in a friendship is loyalty. And I just tell you, if you're my friend, you're stuck with me for life. <laughs> I think that's the way friendship should be. Through good and bad, through thick and thin. And uh, if I'm your friend, I'm always your friend. And if you'll endeavor to be a friend of someone else, you will have friends. Don't be like those in that city that came under attack and they were destroyed because they had no ties with anyone. Friends are essential. And here's a fourth one, and this is a double-barreled one. Family and fun, for me, have been essential. Keeping my wife and kids as a priority has translated into my home being a safe haven during the difficult seasons and storms of life, a place where we could laugh, love, fight, and make up, it's been a safe haven to do all of it. And it's been invaluable in helping me to keep a healthy perspective and staying rested during the difficult seasons. Now, contrary to popular belief, the Conley home is not hyper-spiritual. <laughs> not at all. Some of you would be very, very surprised if you came into our home. It's very relaxed. It's full of good-natured teasing that I sort of lead the way in, and we have lots of grace for one another. I love to be at my home. And then the other side of that, the other barrel of that is, is fun. You know, you can get so absorbed in your troubles and your trials and your frustrations that you lose the joy of living. And I just want to tell you, you need to have some sort of a hobby, some sort of an outlet, whatever it is. You know, I like to golf. I like to jump in the ocean, kill God's creatures with a spear gun. <laughs> Very therapeutic for me. And I don't look at those things as necessities. I don't look at those things as luxuries. I look at them as necessities. Um, it, it'll just keep things from breaking down. You need to... Do something that you enjoy. And it can really help during the hard seasons of life. I could say a lot about that, but I'm going to leave that there and just go right to the fifth and the final one, and that's the mission. Always keep the mission in focus. Keep the first thing first, always. And that's bringing a living Jesus to a dying world. That's the mission for my life. It's the mission for Cottonwood Church, and it should be the mission for every one of God's children I think we need to keep in mind that life is short. There's an old Latin saying, ars longa vita brevis. Art is long, life is short. It's very true. The painting outlasts the painter. Our life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And then comes eternity, friend. And whether you're a banker or a preacher or a trucker or a an architect, a student, an athlete, an entertainer, a poet, whatever you might be, always, always come back to the mission and the one that heads that mission, the one that the mission is about, Jesus Christ. Now, look at a final verse with me, and I'm going to just, just comment on it for a moment. In Ephesians 2, verse 20, it says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And we think of a cornerstone, and it's like the, you know, the, 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 the central town hall building or city hall, and there's this, you know, the stone in the corner of the building, and it's in, inscribed and engraved. But that doesn't necessarily mean that. In fact, I have a translation, one of the many that I have. It, it actually translates that as the coping stone. The cornerstone, but the coping stone. And you wouldn't have to go too, too far back in history to get a fuller understanding of what that was about. 
In the ancient world, when a city was going to be laid out, they would fashion a stone that had exact dimensions. And they would then set that stone exactly north, south, east, and west. And then the entire city was laid out against that stone. Every street was laid out, and they would continually come back and get their measurements from that stone. They would continually come back and make sure that everything was exactly plumb perfect from that stone. It's called a coping stone. That's what and who Jesus is. We get involved in a lot of things in life, but we always need to come back and get our bearings from Him. We always need to come back and measure things against Jesus. We always need to come back and make sure that our life is plumb line straight with Jesus and what He is about and what His mission is about. And whatever we do in one way or another must relate back to our Savior and the Great Commission. It'll help you during the rough seasons of life to keep things from getting off keel, to become skewed, and from your life getting off the rails. Always, always come back to Jesus Christ. Hey there, wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life, I just want you to know God knows you and He knows about you and He loves you. You are not unknown to Him. You're not a faceless person in the crowd. There's a God in heaven that knows your name, and He wants to help you, and He wants to be involved in your life. Call on the name of His Son, Jesus. You won't be disappointed. This is John. He recently lost his job, and he's wrestling with questions of why. Why did this happen to him? Why now? Meet Sarah. She is dealing with the sudden loss of a loved one. She's searching for answers and needs comfort and hope. In these difficult and uncertain days, many people are searching for answers, wandering through life with a growing feeling of hopelessness. Perhaps you. But there are answers when those tough times hit, no matter what you're facing. Answers that are found in Bayless Conley's booklet, Where is God When Hard Times Hit? That's why Answers with Bayless Conley would like to bless you for your support this month by giving you a copy of this booklet. Just request your copy when you call the number on your screen to give your gift or when you go online to AnswersBC.org. Your support is deeply appreciated as it is vital to making it possible for Answers with Bayless Conley to reach our world with the hope of Jesus Christ. So thank you for your generosity. And again, to thank you for your support, we would like to send you a copy of Bayless Conley's powerful booklet, Where is God When Hard Times Hit? Find hope and strength during life's hard times. Please call today or visit AnswersBC.org. Thank you for helping reach the lost and hurting with the answers they long for. Answers found in Jesus Christ.